Tonight we're gathered in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Dalhousie University is within spitting distance of Shibukto, the Great Harbor, and we have plenty of Atlantic coast, which is perfect for tonight's lecture, and also for the approaching Hurricane Lee and the potential impact that it may have. I'd also like to recognize that uh, Dalhousie University uh, has benefited from the proceeds of slavery. A considerable portion of Dal's initial endowment came from taxes on slave-produced goods, and Dalhousie still has work to do to move towards racial justice. My name's Will Langford. I am a professor in the College of Sustainability, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, Double Billing. Uh, it is partly the first lecture of the Environment, Sustainability, and Society lecture series. The ESS lecture series is a key event of the college. We bring in experts with different perspectives on sustainability issues, and they can share with you. And my thanks to Deborah Ross for putting together the fall 2023 schedule. And as you'll see tonight, uh, there'll be a lecture followed by questions from you, the audience. So this is a way to engage you as well. And I said it was a double billing. This is uh, co-sponsored by uh, the Marine and Environmental Law Institute. It's the 15th Douglas M. Johnston lecture, and we are delighted to work with Mila. So I'm now going to introduce Sarah Sek. Sarah Sek is the uh, director of the Marine and en Environmental Law uh, Institute, as well as a professor in the law school. Welcome. Thank you very much, Will. <laughs> and we are delighted at the Marine and Environmental Law Institute to have the opportunity again to co-sponsor with um, ESS the Douglas M. Johnston Lecture. I'm just gonna say a couple of words about um, MELA first. Um, we're based at the Schulich School of Law. There's a long history um, if, of professors and researchers um, playing a role as a leader in research, education, consultancy, and training. Um, we currently have 11 faculty associates together with research associates and fellows. Um, and we share expertise in diverse aspects of Canadian and international marine and environmental governance law and policy. And through programs um, at MEL Law, law students are able to specialize through the completion of what we call MELP certificates. Um, in July of this year, I took on the role as director of MEL Law, and together with my colleague Sarah Ross, who's over here, um, and who will be leading uh, the question and answer, um, uh, Sarah serves as the, so Sarah and Sarah, um, in case you noticed, um, <laughs> serves as the Associate Director of, of MELA. Um, and I also wanted to note that for us, this is a challenging time of year. Almost a year ago, we were saddened to lose our colleague, Meinhard Dewell, in a, in a tragic accident. Uh, Meinhard was a leader in Canadian and international environmental law and policy, um, and he was a close friend also of the College of Sustainability. Uh, so we're pleased in his honor to announce that we are launching towards the end of this series um, what we're going to call the Meinhard Dewell Legacy Lecture uh, in November. Um, and so in part, we're hoping that we will use Meinhard's legacy to sort of launch a very hopeful message about the potential of solutions to sustainability challenges. This evening, we are hosting, delighted to host, the Douglas M. Johnston Lecture. Um, it's an annual lecture. It began in 20, 2009, um, honoring the late Douglas M. Johnston. Um, Douglas M. Johnston was, let me make sure I've got my notes right here, <laughs> a leader a teacher, a scholar, a writer, and has been described as an internationalist in the field of public international law, especially in law of the sea and international environmental law. Um, he was born in Scotland in 1939. He joined Dalhousie in 1972. And among his numerous contributions uh, was the development of the Marine and Environmental Law Program at the law school, as well as the co-founding and directing of both the multidisciplinary Dalhousie Ocean Studies Program, and the Southeast Asian Program in Ocean Law Policy and Management centered in Bangkok, Thailand. 
And these initiatives and activities gave Dalhousie and the law school an, an international reputation as a center of legal research and education in international law and especially in marine and environmental law. Um, and beyond this, he published groundbreaking scholarly works, including in fisheries, theories of ocean boundary, treaty law, and history. And his last book, completed shortly before he died, was awarded a posthumous award by the American Society of International Law. And so in his honor, we are absolutely delighted uh, that Professor Natalie Klein has agreed to come as our uh, Douglas M. Johnson speaker this year. Um, she is a professor at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, uh, with the Faculty of Law and Justice in Australia, and also an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. She's currently the president of the Australian branch of, international, branch of the International Law Association and a trustee for the UK-based charity Human Rights at Sea. Professor Klein was previously the dean of Macquarie Law School and prior to this worked as an, at an international law firm for the government of Eritrea and in the Office of Legal Affairs at the United Nations. Her research focuses on, on law of the sea and international dispute resolution with recent publications including Judging the Law of the Sea with Kate Parlett, an edited volume on unconventional lawmaking in the law of the sea, and most recently a co-edited research handbook on international marine environmental law. And so with that introduction, I'm delighted to have Natalie come and um, give the lecture this evening on judicialization of international marine environmental law. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to join you this evening and particularly to be able to talk at a lecture which uh, is in honor of uh, Professor Douglas Johnston. I began studying uh, the law of the sea as a graduate student and it was impossible to be working in law of the sea at the time and not be reading Professor Johnston's work. And my um, postgraduate research work was on dispute settlement in the law of the sea. And so when I heard that Professor Johnston, during his time here at Dalhousie, had focused on international environmental law as well as the law of the sea, and I thought, well, since I came across his work looking at dispute settlement, I'm going to bring all of these together for the purposes of tonight's lecture and talking about judicialization of international marine environmental law. So just to situate us in what we're talking about uh, tonight, when we're talking about international marine environmental law, we're interested in quite a few different things. The one that would be most familiar with many people would of course be issues related to marine pollution. So when we think of marine pollution, we're thinking about the oil that is getting spilled out of vessels. We're thinking about the diversity of plastics that are finding their way into ocean areas. Recent research is also talking about how caffeine is coming through land-based sources into the marine environment and also causing harm to the ecosystems. So from the coffee we drink through to the release of nuclear uh, waters from the Fukushima plant, marine pollution is a very big part of international marine environmental law. But it's not just about marine pollution, of course, we're interested in marine biodiversity as well. So in this respect, we're thinking about the deep sea creatures that live around these hydrothermal vents and the regulation of deep seabed mining under a new code that's being talked about. We're thinking about the regulations to protect uh, megafauna like the whale shark you see on the slides from um, international trade under the Convention on the International Trade and Endangered Species. And of course, we're interested in the conservation and management of fisheries, uh, fish that are taken for animal consumption and for pet consumption, as well as accidentally uh, in other pursuits as well. So international marine environmental law brings all of these different considerations together. We have a large number of laws that have developed under customary international law, under different treaties that regulate these issues, general principles as well as fairly specific rules. We have a large number of regulatory tools that have been developed, such as marine protected areas, um, regulations around the type of gear that you can use, and also rules around compliance and enforcement. And this is where the judicialization starts setting in. 
Some of the research that I've been doing has been looking at informal agreements. You heard Sarah mention the unconventional lawmaking. So, for example, the sustainable development goals that I'm sure you're familiar with. That's where we're setting standards about what states are supposed to do. And we're not creating legally binding obligations in the sustainable development goals, but it's still moderating behaviour. So that in itself has a kind of normative element to it. And lots of different actors, not just states, can be involved in informal lawmaking. And I think that's where the international courts and tribunals come in. So they are also involved in their own sort of lawmaking, and this is where we can start thinking about judicialization of international marine environmental law. So you see the word judicialization. What am I actually talking about when I say that? When I first sort of used the term, I was just sort of thinking about the involvement of courts and tribunals, but some international relations scholars have looked at this, and uh, Karen Alter and some colleagues have gone further and said, well, judicialization is really this process by which international judicial bodies shape or dominate international politics. So it's this idea that judicial decision makers are actually limiting the sovereignty of states by their decisions. So the courts are coming in, and where we would expect states to perhaps be making decisions about international law. Instead, it's the courts that are really on the front, front foot here. And I think that this question of judicialization is really an important one at the moment when we think about the approaches to different international courts, looking for advisory opinions on climate change. And so this is what I want to look at uh, with you this evening to talk about some of the different international courts and tribunals that are have authority to be able to make decisions about international marine environmental law. Also want to talk about, in particular, their judicial engagement. To what extent are we getting these developments in the law that are taking away or dominating states? So we'll need to look at some of the decisions of the International Court of Justice and also what's happening under the dispute settlement mechanism of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And once we kind of get a sense of, well, is there judicialization, we can go, well, is this a good thing? Why do we need to turn to international courts? What's the benefits of doing that? And I think we also have to think about what are some of the risks involved as well. So just to start off and talk a bit about the judicial landscape, uh, I mentioned, of course, the International Court of Justice and the dispute settlement bodies under UNCLOS as uh, two of the main sites, I think, but really there's, it's not limited to those particular judicial fora. We can also look at a whole range of other international institutions that have dispute settlement mechanisms where decisions have been made. Certainly in terms of international environmental law, we have seen that getting more airing before different human rights bodies, particularly with the right to a clean environment being talked about. Also, in the context of investor state dispute settlement, uh, again, the environment has been getting showcased where we have situations that states change their environmental laws. And foreign investors now say that their foreign investment is prejudiced as a result of that. So tribunals have to make decisions on that. The World Trade Organization, uh, you might have heard of a decision related to shrimps and turtles has also come on board in looking at in what instances international environmental law can impact international trade. I also mentioned claims commissions. That hasn't been a huge site, I must acknowledge, around international environmental law, but certainly following Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, where uh, Iraq, in um, trying to withdraw from Kuwait, set fire to a whole range of different oil wells. The pollution that flowed from that, including pollution into the marine environment, was part of the claims that went to a claims commission and reparations were sought for that and has been influential in how we assess compensation for environmental claims. But we're going to be focusing on the ICJ and also dispute settlement under UNCLOS. When I'm talking about dispute settlement under UNCLOS uh, or the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, just be aware that this is a multilateral treaty. There's 169 uh, states, including the European Union, uh, that are parties to this particular treaty. And when states join this treaty, similar to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the moment that they sign up to this treaty, they're also consenting to the possibility that a dispute could be referred to a court or a tribunal 
uh, for resolution. Normally you need some extra show of consent, but UNCLOSE is a bit different in as much that once you're a party to the treaty, that's it, you've consented. There are some exceptions to the disputes that can go uh, to the UNCLOSE courts and tribunals. And one of those exceptions, interestingly, for our purposes, relates to fishing in the exclusive economic zone. But largely, disputes relating to the protection and preservation of the marine environment are subject to compulsory jurisdiction. And this is where we're seeing, I think, some of this judicialization of international marine environmental law happening. So um, there are different fora that might be utilized under the Unclosed Dispute Settlement Mechanism, uh, including possibly referral to the International Court of Justice. But really the two main sites that we're talking about here is the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, it's an international court that's based in Hamburg, and this week is where there are currently hearings um, before it lost relating to obligations of states uh, concerning uh, climate change, which uh, we'll talk about, and also Annex 7 arbitral tribunals. So, Understanding that these are our different sites that we're looking at, let's first of all consider what has been happening at the International Court of Justice. So when I started thinking about, well, you know, what's been the contribution for international marine environmental law at the International Court of Justice, I actually came up short a little bit at the start. And I thought, well, actually, most of the decisions to do with international uh, law and the environment are really more environmentally focused, not so much the marine environment. But this has been important for international marine environmental law as well. So, for example, the pulp mills decision was important because it told us what a standard of due diligence involved. So the court said there was a requirement of due diligence imposed on states to regulate and enforce laws against private actors that may negatively impact the environment. And in the pulp mills judgment, the court uh, described due diligence as an obligation to deploy adequate means to exercise best possible efforts to do the utmost to obtain a result. And this standard is one that's now also employed in relation to the marine environment. The ICJ has also endorsed the principle of prevention, which is this idea that no state should take action within its jurisdiction that is going to cause harm uh, to another state and within its jurisdiction. And this was a statement it made in an advisory opinion looking at the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons. So the court has engaged with international environmental law, but I was like, well, surely something's been said about marine environmental law. And I thought, well, there's been cases about fisheries following the Turbot War, following the Cod Wars. But the court really didn't advance, I didn't think, the substantive law relating to the conservation of fisheries in any uh, strong way in those judgments. But then we have the case that Australia brought against Japan dealing with whaling in Antarctica. So Australia took Japan to the International Court of Justice because Japan was undertaking what Japan called scientific whaling. But Australia said, actually, no, this is just commercial whaling. Uh, but you're calling it scientific whaling because you're not allowed to do commercial whaling in Antarctica. So Australia and Japan had both accepted the jurisdiction of the court, Australia instituted proceedings, and the dispute was really largely about treaty interpretation and what was the obligation under the International Convention on the Regulation of Whaling. Now, Australia did win that case, and the court did say that what Japan was doing could not be considered for the purposes of scientific research. So the result was that Japan did stop the program that it was engaged in at the time, seemingly a victory for, for international justice. But then Japan said, all right, well, now we'll come up with a new scientific program that is for the purposes of scientific research. So it did so, but then states challenged that particular uh, research program as well. Japan changed its acceptance of compulsory jurisdiction, then it decided to withdraw from the International Whaling Commission and cease its whaling activities in Antarctica, but only undertake whaling in its own maritime zones. So if you're thinking about judicialization being a situation where the court has taken a step and taken power away from a state, 
it seems to me that the whaling case actually shows that the state very much retained power over what it was doing in relation to whaling. So while I was sort of left at this point thinking, oh, well, the judicialization of international marine environmental law from the ICJ is not terribly strong, but I thought this could well be about to change when we consider that the ICJ has now had a question referred to it looking at the obligations of states in respect of climate change. So in March of this year, um, Vanuatu, uh, along with some youth uh, grassroots groups, got together and essentially came up with some questions that they wanted to put to the International Court of Justice, asking questions about what are the obligations of states when it comes to climate change. So ultimately, uh, this question it had to come via the UN General Assembly. A resolution was adopted by consensus, so every state agreed to it. There are 105 other states that sponsored this resolution. So there's a very strong agreement in the end that these questions should go to the International Court of Justice. So these questions are, are actually quite big ones, so I'm going to just highlight a little bit how it's going to relate to international marine environmental law for our purposes. So the first question that's going to be put to the court is this question around, well, what are the obligations under international law to ensure protection of other parts of the environment? And the marine environment has to fall within the other parts of the environment. So the court will have an opportunity to look at issues such as sea level rise, such as ocean acidification. Um, and give some indication of what those obligations might be. And then the opinion needs to go further and not just say what the obligations are, but also talk about the consequences. So what are the legal consequences when uh, states' actions or omissions have caused significant harm to the marine environment as another part of the environment? And this is with respect to states, in particular small island developing states, because those are the states most at risk from rising sea levels. So with these particular decisions, well, opinions that the court needs to make, it has an opportunity to really um, give much greater clarity on what the obligations are for states. It's important to recognize that an advisory opinion is not formally legally binding. When two states take a case to the court and it's a contentious decision, that judgment is final and binding on those particular par parties. For an advisory opinion, it's said not to be legally binding, but the reality is that when the court states somewhat definitively what international law obligations are, states tend to take notice of that and it can have a range of different effects. It will have an effect in terms of uh, negotiations between states on these issues. It will have an effect in terms of bilateral relationships in dealing with some of these climate change questions. And I can also imagine that to the extent there's still domestic climate change cases going ahead, that some of the decisions of the court will also be brought in to those sorts of proceedings as well. So the potential here, I think, is quite significant. It's hard to know at this point uh, whether the court will be somewhat conservative in its approach and whether it will just try and stick to the wording of existing agreements like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, or if it will actually use the opportunity to go a little bit further uh, than it has to date. And I think also it, there's an opportunity for the court to engage with the advisory opinion that we're also going to be expecting from ITLOS. So let me turn to some of the contributions then to international marine environmental law that have come through the dispute settlement regime under UNCLOS. So there have been about 50 cases uh, decided under UNCLOS so far. It's actually a fairly modest number when you compare it uh, to some other institutions. But I thought, you know, on a generous understanding of the marine environment, when you look through all these different cases, well over half of these cases, in one way or another, have had implications for the marine environment, both at ITLOS and in ad hoc arbitration. So in thinking about how they've really had an impact in terms of international marine environmental law, I think it's worth focusing on two particular provisions of UNCLOS. And one of them is Article 192 
And simply, Article 192 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea says that states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. That's it. It's a pretty simple statement. And so much has been read into what this actually involves. And commentators have said, well, yes, you've got this one basic provision, and it lends itself to a dynamic interpretation. So in the South China Sea arbitration between the Philippines and China, the tribunal at the time recognized that Article 192 entails a positive obligation to take active measures to protect and preserve the marine environment, and by logical implication, entails the negative obligation not to degrade the marine environment. So Article 192 was put to the tribunal as a provision that China had violated because of the island building activities that it had undertaken. Now, it should be recognized that every state that borders the South China Sea has undertaken some amount of island building activities. But what China has done has been uh, quite uh, considerable compared to some of the other island building and land reclamation work. Um, perhaps that's putting it mildly too. So the Philippines' main complaint related to seven reefs that were in the Spratly Islands group, and you can see in these pictures how these particular reefs uh, were developed over time. So China was using a large fleet of vessels uh, that employed heavy cutter suction dredge equipment to create almost 13 square kilometers of new land in less than three years. So these reef systems were impacted because of the construction, because of the dredging, and, and so there was harm both directly to the reefs at the time, but also indirect harm to the benthic organisms, so the corals and the seagrass, as well as the pelagic, the um, fish in the water column as well, as a result of this. Now, in assessing whether China had violated unclose requirements to protect and preserve the marine environment, the South China Sea considered Article 192 and said that there was a duty to prevent or at least mitigate significant harm to the marine environment during the pursuit of large-scale construction activities. So we've gone from states have an obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment to this duty to prevent or at least mitigate significant harm to the marine environment during large-scale construction activities. But the jurisprudence has since gone further in relation to Article 192. So tribunals have also said that the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment also includes um, reference to conserving and managing the marine living resources. And this was kind of an interesting decision because you might recall at the start I said there isn't compulsory jurisdiction over every dispute under UNCLOS. And fisheries in the EEZ are supposed to be one of the categories outside jurisdiction. But not when you can call it a dispute relating to the protection of the marine environment. It's not a fisheries dispute now, it's a marine environment dispute, and therefore it's within jurisdiction. So to me, this is judicialization in action. The courts are saying, actually, states, you might have thought this was not something we were going to decide. But in fact, this does fall within our remit and we do have authority to make decisions in relation to these issues. So in the South China Sea arbitration, the Philippines alleged that harmful fishing activities violated China's duties to protect and preserve the marine environment because Chinese fishers had engaged in harvesting of corals and giant clams using destructive fishing techniques. And corals and giant clams are endangered species. They're listed on something known as the IUCN Red List, which is supposed to give you an indication of the conservation status of a large number of species. And corals and giant clams are listed on that. But uh, Chinese fishers were using the propellers of small ships. They were using explosives to be able to retrieve these species. So this conduct was also found to have violated Article 192. So the finding was based on the t determination that China was aware of, tolerated and failed to prevent harvesting of endangered species on a significant scale and that harvesting giant clams in a manner severely destructive of the coral reef ecosystem also violated the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment.
So since then, the jurisprudence has gone on and also under the frame of Article 192, we now know that flag states, so the states that are responsible for ships that are registered to their particular country, they have to ensure that their vessels comply with coastal states conservation measures, otherwise they're potentially violating Article 192. Flag states also have to ensure that their ships are conforming to rules that might have been set out by a regional fisheries management organisation. So if the fishing vessels are not following the rules of a regional organisation, well that again could be a violation of Article 192. So in lots of different ways, we see that Article 192 is a way that courts are now being able to hold states to account for their actions in relation to the marine environment. So there's one other provision in Bunkless where this is also happening, which is Article 194. It's not quite as short, sharp and shiny as 192, so I haven't given you the full text, but in essence what it's about is the core obligation to prevent, reduce and control pollution of the marine environment. Now, the scope of this particular provision was talked about in a case that Mauritius brought against the United Kingdom relating to the Chagos Archipelago, and that's the Chagos Archipelago you can see up on the screen. It's a group of islands found in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and uh, the United Kingdom has leased out the largest island, Diego Garcia, to the United States to use as a military facility. So the United Kingdom uh, separated the Chagos Archipelago from the rest of Mauritius, when Mauritius asserted its right to independence. And uh, it's now known as the British Indian Ocean Territory. And there's been a whole lot of different disputes related uh, to this particular area. But the case that I wanted to bring to your attention is known as the Chagos Marine Protected Area Arbitration because Mauritius was challenging the United Kingdom's decision to declare a marine protected area over the entire exclusive economic zone of the Chagos Archipelago, which was going to have an impact on the fishing rights that Mauritius still had in that area. And Mauritius said that the United Kingdom did not inform Mauritius of its plans, it provided Mauritius with inaccurate information, and it ignored Mauritius's repeated calls for bilateral consultations, insisting on proceeding um, with the proposal. So for our purposes, what was interesting was the tribunal's discussion around Article 194 and saying that it extends to measures focused primarily on conservation and preservation of ecosystems. So again, Article 194, it's not just about marine pollution. We're thinking about the impact on marine ecosystems. Now, in this instance, the failures of the UK to consult was found to violate other provisions of UNCLOS, not Article 194 but it was still relevant in terms of how we understand this language of Article 194, particularly because it was then picked up further in the South China Sea um, Arbitral Tribunal as well. And once again, the tribunal found that uh, the island building activity had also violated Article 194. But I did want to give you one example where I think the judicialization has been held in check a little bit and it's in relation to Article 194. So I mentioned how it's not just about pollution, it's also about protecting the ecosystems. Now there's one part of Article 194 that refers to protecting um, depleted, threatened uh, or endangered species and other forms of marine life. So the Philippines claimed that uh, this particular provision had been violated and the tribunal had to interpret what this meant. And so the tribunal said, okay, so how do we understand what ecosystem means? And they said, oh, I know, that's been decided under the Convention on Biological Diversity. We'll just use that definition. So they didn't go any further than that. That was what states had agreed. Then they said, all right, well, now we have to figure out which species count for being threatened and depleted uh, or endangered under UNCLOS. And it said, well, that's handy. We have another treaty we can look to, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species, because endangered species are listed uh, by states under that particular treaty. 
So that was a very neat way for the tribunal to manage the problem. But the difficulty is, is that when species are listed under the Convention on International Trade and in Endangered Species, or you might hear it referred to as CITES sometimes, that's not just a scientific decision, that's also a political decision as to whether states are willing to have particular protections uh, given to different species. And there are many instances where species are endangered or threatened, yet they're not listed under CITES because states do not want restrictions on international trade. So in that respect, I think the tribunal in interpreting this provision by reference to CITES, it has shown some deference to states. So how is this going to change potentially with our climate change advisory opinion? So ITLOS is another body that also has a request for an advisory opinion before it. And this is a question that has been submitted by the Commission on Small Island States. So there are limitations on the jurisdiction of ITLOS. It's not, it's not actually stated clearly in its statute that it can give advisory opinions. But it went through this process and said, well, you know, if an organisation, you know, asks us for an advisory opinion, well, and it's to do with UNCLOSE, we'll give the advisory opinion, it's okay. So some states heard this and they thought, all right, well, we want an advisory opinion on legal obligations related to climate change and the marine environment, so we'll form an organisation. So COSIS was formed, so the Commission on Small Island States um, was formed initially by uh, Tuvalu and Antigua and Barbuda, and subsequently, I think it was Niue, Saint Lucia, um, Vanuatu uh, has also joined this organization. And in creating this organization, the mandate was to promote and contribute to the rules and principles of international law concerning climate change, uh, particularly relating to the protection and preservation of the marine environment. And Article 2 then gave authority to request an advisory opinion. So that was the basis to gather jurisdiction. And then these are the questions that have been asked of ITLOS. So it's asking for an opinion on the tribunal's advice on the specific obligations to prevent, reduce and control pollution of the marine environment. Remember that language? That's Article 194 in relation to the deleterious effects that result or are likely to result from climate change, including through ocean warming, sea level rise, and ocean acidification caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. The second question are the specific obligations to protect and preserve the marine environment in relation to climate change impacts. That's Article 192. So very much uh, drawing on the existing jurisprudence. So far, we've had one round of written pleadings. Uh, now, this week, uh, the oral round is on. And we'll probably get a judgment on this, I think, in about May of next year. One of the judges uh, had indicated that in an op-ed piece. So the opinion from the ITLOS will come out before we get the opinion from the ICJ. So in terms of engagement in this proceeding, just to note that Every state that is a party to UNCLOSE had an opportunity to make submissions to the tribunal. 32 states did so. There was quite a variety of states across the different geographic areas. But in addition, uh, with ITLOS, different intergovernmental organisations also have standing to be able to make submissions to the tribunal. And different to the ICJ, is that non-governmental organisations can also submit pleadings to ITLOS. So all of these different NGOs submitted written submissions as well. They're not considered strictly part of the case file because they come from non-governmental organisations, but they're all put up on um, the uh, tribunal's website and are accessible to the judges and to the parties who are arguing the case. So in terms of what this advisory opinion is likely to do, it's going to have to deal with the fact that the opinion that it needs to give it needs to be an interpretation and application of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So there's going to be questions about, well, to what extent will it loss draw in uh, questions related to the Framework Convention and the Paris Agreement? 
What I think is going to be a fairly clear and easy decision for the tribunal is the definition of pollution. UNCLOS is a treaty that has something like 300 plus provisions in it, and it contains very, very few definitions of all the terms, but one of the terms it defines is pollution. And when you look at the definition of pollution, you can read into that relatively easily that it includes greenhouse gases. And well before we got the recent requests for advisory opinions, a lot of commentators had already looked at this question and, and looking at the written pleadings, I think there's a fairly strong agreement that greenhouse gases are a form of pollution when considering um, the obligations to protect the marine environment. But beyond that, we're going to have to see what the court can do with its readings of Article 194 and 192 as they relate to each of those particular questions. And I think what we'll also see is the tribunal drawing on those general principles that the ICJ have articulated in relation to the principle of prevention and uh, due diligence. And also the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has also not quite embraced the precautionary principle they like to talk about. Um, showing prudence and caution rather than referring to precaution, but they're kind of there. And also have a fairly expansive view on the obligation to cooperate too. But we shall see how all of that unfolds. So why is it that we're getting this turn to international courts? What's, what's going on here? Why is this beneficial potentially? I mean, first and foremost, it's always going to be about resolving a dispute. And that's particularly for our contentious proceedings where a state or two or three have, or more, have different views over what the obligations mean. And they turn to the international court to find out what, whether their conduct is actually consistent or not. Sometimes the very fact that proceedings, judicial proceedings begin can be enough in itself uh, to resolve a dispute. So for example, Malaysia brought proceedings against Singapore challenging land reclamation uh, activities that Singapore was undertaking. And Malaysia sought um, provisional measures or like an injunction to try and stop Singapore from doing uh, further land reclamation work while the case was being heard. And it lost at that time said, you know what, we'll, we'll have a look at some of the different provisional measures. And what we think you really need to do is you need an independent group of experts to get together and look at what's going on and come up with some ideas. So that was one of the provisional measures. The group of experts got together, gave recommendations, and that effectively resolved the dispute and the case was discontinued. So the mere fact of actually instituting proceedings made a difference. Similarly, there was a case uh, Australia and New Zealand brought against Japan relating to an experimental fishing program. This was uh, fish, not whales, southern bluefin tuna. And in this case, uh, the tribunal decided it lacked jurisdiction. So there was no final decision on the merits. But both Australia and New Zealand lawyers, um, perhaps trying to put a positive spin on their loss, said, well, actually, it's been really helpful because we've now gone back to the Southern Bluefin Tuna Commission and we're now able to negotiate again and in a way that we weren't able to do because of this dispute previously. So the very fact that you engage in this process can go some way to sort of resetting relationships, changing the expectations around how certain conduct is to happen. And then, of course, another reason to turn to international courts is for the development of the law. And there's, that's really where advisory opinions can make a big difference too. So the authoritative contribution of a judgment can be borne out in future cases. We don't have a strict system of precedent in international law, but in the public order of the oceans, we like stability and predictability, just as we do in other areas of international law. And so there will be references back to previous decisions. And certainly we've seen this already in relation to the inclusion of the conservation and management of fish within protecting the marine environment. The ICJ now has said that, you know, conservation and management of fish is part of protecting and preserving the marine environment. So we see how, how these um, views can grow. And then, of course, another outlet for assessing the authoritative nature of a judgment is how the judgment's received beyond um, the actual parties itself, 
does it actually influence other states in their decisions? Um, I have done a study of compliance uh, with a colleague of all the decisions that have so far come out under UNCLOSE, and the record of compliance is actually quite good, except for the South China Sea uh, arbitration, where that's a clear case of non-compliance. But states do use these decisions to change their policies, they've used them to change their domestic laws, they've used it to change their domestic legislation, all to better align with expectations on what the international law obligations are. When I was thinking of reasons about why I turned to international courts, I thought, oh, well, remedies, that's the other reason you go to a court, because you want to get reparations at the end of your particular case. But when I thought about that further, I thought, actually, given what we have seen so far, I think that is actually one of the risks for turning to international courts. So I will explain that one further in a moment. So in terms of the risks in turning to international courts, I think we do need to think a little bit further. If we've got this judicialization going on, this idea that we're taking authority away from states and giving it to courts, who are the judges? Who are the people that are making these decisions? So if we're going to the International Court of Justice, we know there are 15 judges there. And we know that of those 15 judges, five of them come from what's known as the Western European and other group. The other includes Canada, it includes Australia, New Zealand, the United States. So five judges from there, two from Eastern Europe, three from Asia, three from Africa, and two from Latin America. But when you're thinking about a case or an opinion that's going to come out in relation to an advisory opinion on climate change, I thought, well, how many of these judges come from countries that are the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases? So six of the judges come from countries that are in the top um, number of countries that emit greenhouse gases. And because I was interested in the marine environmental law side, I thought, well, Let's think about how many of these different judges come from island states. And I thought, okay, well, there's three judges from island states, but the question you might recall refers to small island developing states. So small island, that immediately rules out Australia. Japan, not a developing state. So we have one judge on the bench who is from a small island developing state who is there to potentially give views except for the fact that the process that we're going through with the ICJ at the moment, the first round of written pleadings uh, will be submitted in January. There's then three months and then there will be a second round of written pleadings. We probably won't get to oral arguments until the end of next year and then presumably a judgment sometime after that. We have elections coming up for the ICJ and Judge Robinson is not standing again for the court. And the five judges who are going to be running for election, none of them are from small island developing states. So we won't have anyone on the bench that will be able to bring that particular uh, perspective to bear. Now, looking at the judges in unclosed dispute settlement, uh, this was something that I looked at with Kate Parlett in the book that we wrote called Judging the Law of the Sea. And when we were looking at the different decision makers, because of the possibility that there's four different institutions that can hear disputes, we calculated over 2,000 different people could potentially be involved in unclosed dispute settlement. Of course, what's potentially the case is not what's really the case. In the end, if you look at who is actually making the decisions, the number is much smaller. So in the book, when we looked at um, the first 14 ad hoc arbitrations uh, that had been held under UNCLOSE, there had been 69 uh, different arbitrators, but some of those had appeared twice in cases. So once we took out the duplicates, we were left with 45 different arbitrators. Then we looked at who those arbitrators were. The oldest was born in 1927, the youngest was born in 1958, and only five were born after 1950. And when you're talking about, well, what are the impacts for future generations, I thought age might make a bit of a difference. There was only one woman who was appointed to serve as an Annex 7 arbitrator, and uh, she was appointed for a case that uh, was settled before it actually proceeded to hearings in the end. <coughs> 
and that was Judge Elsa Kelly from Argentina, and she was also the first judge appointed to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Of those 45 judges, 27 came from developed countries. Only six did not have formal education from either Western Europe or the United States. In looking at them, the other thing that was interesting was that they were fairly evenly divided between common law and civil law jurisdictions. So just to the extent that your background has some influence in how you approach certain questions, then these factors may be relevant. And then we had a look at the composition of ITLOS. And for the first 15 years of ITLOS, there uh, were no women who served as judges at ITLOS. We now have five women who, um, who serve as judges uh, on this particular tribunal. And also when we look at ITLOS, we automatically have more geographic diversity. But that's because there is a requirement for geographic diversity in the appointment of judges under um, Annex 6 of UNCLOS. But then when you start drilling down, um, amongst all of those judges, while the nationalities vary more, the educational background does not. All but four of the judges received formal education in Western Europe or the United States. And only seven of the judges come from non-civil law jurisdictions. So that's either common law or mixed jurisdictions. And I think that matters when you're thinking about approaches to procedural questions and the relevance of precedent. The other interesting fact about all of the ITLOS judges is that the vast majority of them have served as legal advisors to their governments as well. Now, I don't mean to impugn the integrity or you know, the judicial independence of any of these individuals. All of them swear an oath that they will be independent and so forth. But I do think in terms of you know, what is your subconscious biases that come through? What are the influences that you have when you're looking at some of these questions? That some of these issues matter. And also that the attributes and characteristics of individual judges are important because of the widely representative group with different political and cultural representations more likely to be perceived as producing credible and authoritative judgments. So I thought, since I'd looked at it for the ICJ judges, I'd better have a look at the composition of ITLOS as it stands at the moment as it hears um, arguments relating to the obligations for climate change. And in this instance, I had to look a little bit further. I went with the top 15 countries who are global um, greenhouse gas emitters, and we had about seven of the judges from there. But then when I went to look at uh, the small island, well, not necessarily developing states, but small island states, and also I was thinking about other countries that uh, are particularly considered at risk for sea level rise, which includes India and Thailand and China, actually. Then the numbers start increasing, and I think the issue of sea level rise is one that um, ITLOS is going to have to deal with. And about a third of the judges come from countries that uh, would be very conscious of this as an issue. Uh, whether it will make a difference, I guess time will tell. I think another risk of judicialization is also the divide that we have between science and law on occasions as well. So there has been a discussion for many years about whether we should have a case going to the International Court of Justice or going to ITLOS about climate change. And one of the arguments against doing it was because there was some concern that there would not be acceptance that you know, climate change was actually existing as a scientific phenomenon. I think, <laughs> mercifully, I'll just add that in, we're past that point now. And there is confidence that there will not be that kind of pushback against the science in bringing these sorts of opinions. Hopefully, I will not be proved wrong on that point. But it is something that comes up in disputes relating to the marine environment, certainly in the Southern Bluefin Tuna case, Japan said this is really a scientific dispute. Whether we do our experimental fishing program is just a question of science in the end. It's not a legal question. And certainly the whaling case in the end also had this question about, well, what was for you know, scientific purposes? The court, wisely, I think, did not try and give a definition of scientific research. I think uh, all the scientists would have had a good laugh at the international lawyers if they had attempted to do so.
But they did have to come up with this idea about, well, what's for the purposes of scientific research? And they came up with a set of criteria that we could use. So the courts can do it, but I think there's, there's some risks involved there. And also bringing it back in terms of the remedies and the fact that the remedies can be inadequate in the end. So if you think of the South China Sea arbitration where the Philippines must have had the clearest case in the world of environmental harm being caused to these reefs through the island building activity. But the Philippines did not seek compensation, they did not seek restitution, all they sought was de declarations of illegality. Maybe that was a reasonable request on behalf of the Philippines because there was no way that China was ever going to pay compensation and so it was still a win for the Philippines in terms of getting a declaration to that effect. Uh, but it doesn't reverse the damage that has been caused in any way. And the cases that I've mentioned so far haven't really engaged with questions of remedies beyond sort of making declarations about the status of the law. There has been one ICJ case so far that has dealt with compensation for violating international environmental law and has dealt with it in some details, which was the certain activities carried out by Nicaragua in the border area, uh, a case between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. And in this particular case, the court did go through and articulate uh, key principles relevant for determining compensation for environmental harm. And it's interesting, I think, to read some of the judgments that the individual judges gave, as well as the court's opinion, when you think about climate change and what are the reparations that could possibly be awarded in this instance. So in this particular uh, decision, though, the court had a fairly difficult balance that it was trying to make because on the one hand it wanted to say well sure we get it with the environment you can't necessarily prove precisely the damage that has been done or how much you know a tree is worth or how much is a mangrove swamp or wetlands worth so they wanted to show that there would be some flexibility but on the other hand the court was very firm that there should be no punitive damages so how do you find that line between going, well, this is your award of compensation, even though we can't come up with a precise amount, versus we're not going so far as to award punitive damages? And I think the court struggled with that in that particular decision, and certainly the dissenting opinion from uh, Judge Ad Hoc Dugard is worth a read if you are interested in uh, the criticisms around that. So I think so far the reparations from judicial fora seem to be really patently inappropriate when it comes to environmental protection and not just meeting the standard of restoring the situation that exists prior to the commission of the unlawful act. That's our benchmark in international law. But at some point it really does prompt the question about whether you can ever really restore the marine environment uh, to, one, to what it once was. And that's really when dispute prevention and environmental protection, our initial principles, are really so much more important than turning to international courts. And that still needs to be our primary focus. So just to conclude with some, some final thoughts, I, in, I guess in looking at the judicialization of international marine environmental law, I think at the moment, uh, my view with the International Court of Justice is that there hasn't really been much going on there, but gosh, things could change with these advisory opinions on climate change, and it could have um, much broader implications than just the marine environment, though that has been my point of focus. And that will be as true for the dispute settlement under UNCLOSE, as well as it is for the ICJ. What I think is also interesting with the request to ITLOS is you might note that that was only a qu a questions about obligations. There's no questions to ITLOS at this point about consequences. So COSIS, the organization asking these questions, for now they've sidestepped uh, issues around causation, they've sidestepped these questions of reparations. And to me that sounds like a litigation strategy right there in terms of thinking about, well, let's see what the ICJ says on this, and then perhaps we're going to see another advisory opinion being requested in light of the ICJ's decision, 
or perhaps we'll even see contentious proceedings where, for example, uh, Tuvalu could bring a case against China for violating uh, its obligations to prevent, to protect and preserve the marine environment. So, in the end, it seems that with the request from the ICJ as well as ITLOS, and we should also recall there's a request um, also that has gone to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on climate change. I think this judicial voice is destined to become much stronger. Whether it ultimately dominates uh, the voices of political decision makers really remains to be seen. To my mind, I'm always very supportive uh, of international law playing a strong role in uh, critical decisions in the international system. Whether the international courts can or should prevail is something I do have reservations about. Uh, just in finishing at this point, uh, obviously today I'm, I'm here to uh, recognize the memory of Professor Johnston, but I feel it would be remiss of me not to also uh, note that today we have also lost uh, Professor Alan Boyle of the University of Edinburgh, who I feel like almost everything I have said this evening, Alan had said first, whether it was about the possibilities of using UNCLOS to resolve climate change disputes on what a marine environmental law dispute was. You cannot study international environmental law without looking at Alan Boyle's work. So between him and Douglas Johnston, uh, there's a tremendous legacy for us in thinking about some of these issues. So I hope in terms of future generations who are here and who may benefit from their work that you have a way to see that forward. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for that. So now we have a a healthy amount of time for questions. I know we'll have maybe have some questions online as well. So, hi. So I was wondering if any of the cases that you mentioned, like aside from like international interactions, like between borders, if anything aside from the marine law aspect of it intersected with like environmental racism as far as like the groups affected and like the people who might be relying on the ecosystems that are affected and like how that connects to like human life and resource use. Yeah. Could courts not input an as-need basis for funds towards activities specifically for recovering damages? Sorry, I missed the start of that. Could you? Oh, um, I said court. Could, could the courts, the international courts, not put in an as-need basis for funds that other countries have to reprimand um, as they are actively working on recovering those damages? Um, how long does an international court proceeding take and what kind of evidence do you need to go to court? Do you want to go ahead with those? Sure. Three? Uh, and yes, my answer to the first question, unfortunately, is very brief. None of them have really looked at that intersection so far. The different courts and tribunals I referred to and predominantly talking about the ICJ and uh, it lost have been very much interstate disputes where they do not drill down beyond that. I think the ICJ is going to have to go a little bit further with its advisory opinion on climate change because you might recall seeing in the questions that were being asked that they're asking about consequences for present and future generations. And certainly there was a lot of input from uh, civil society actors, including um, younger groups as well, in putting those questions to the court. And I think the court really has to address those questions around intergenerational equity, whether they'll get into looking, I, I'm doubtful they would look at sort of indigenous rights or rights of minority groups or anything like that. However, in the context of it, I think it will already be a step forward for the ICJ to say more just around human rights more generally, because it's so state-based. It hasn't been very progressive on that front to date. Um, in relation to courts and having a fund for damages, uh, at this point, because it's an advisory opinion, uh, they will not, they would not sort of go to that point because the court will be thinking of it in the context of we're not resolving an actual dispute between the greenhouse gas emitter states at this point. We're just giving a legal opinion on what it is. So what you might expect, and as I mentioned with id loss, is I think you get these opinions first of all, and then there'll be subsequent claims. Because so far, 
the negotiations around getting compensation for loss and damage around climate change, it's really, I'm sure some of you know, it's really stalled in the negotiations, uh, particularly with the mechanism, the, the Warsaw mechanism that is supposed to be dealing with that. And there's just no progress being made. But what might, again, you know, this is why we go to courts, because sometimes it can cut through and where we've reached a stalemate or an impasse. And I think that was one of the reasons Australia took that case against Japan. They just hit an impasse in the International Whaling Commission about Japan's whaling program. They couldn't resolve it either way. And you take it to court and then finally you kind of get a statement and it enables them to reset. When you have international cases, generally what happens in, if there's going to be a reparations phase, then that is often held in a separate part of the proceedings and then once an award is made, it's a question of whether a state will actually pay it or not. Uh, so far, at least under UNCLOSE, those cases where there have been awards of damages, they have been paid, uh, except for the Duzgut Integrity one, um, which was an extraordinary large amount of damages that was given against um, say Tomo and Principe, a very small state, and some thought was an exorbitant amount for a small state. Uh, but that's, that's kind of how that has worked so far. So not what you would expect or might be familiar with in domestic proceedings when you might be able to sort of put money aside in anticipation. Uh, in terms of how long uh, the proceedings and the amount of evidence, uh, yes, long. Sometimes it might be that, uh, you know, the parties before the court will say, you know, we want this resolved more quickly and they will agree that not to have additional rounds of written pleadings. So in the Whaling case, for example, they had one round of written pleadings and Australia said, you know, it's fine, let's go straight to the oral hearings and let's be done sooner rather than later. And uh, Japan agreed to that, um, it seemed, or <laughs> with some resistance, but agreed. And so that case actually sort of went from start to finish relatively quickly, but we're still talking a good year. I mean, it was only supposed to be three months from the time the request went. It went in March. It was supposed to be three months for the first round of written pleadings, and they've already requested an extension through to January. Then it's supposed to be another three months for replies to April. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if that gets extended as well. And you see that sometimes the proceedings will be delayed if states want to delay it sometimes for the purposes of trying to reach settlement outside of court, they will delay these cases. Uh, but otherwise it depends on the docket. Um, the ICJ used to only sit in the morning, but you know, they, they changed their practice and they sit in the morning and the afternoon now, so that helps speed things up. Uh, in terms of evidence, um, that has been another reason why there's been some reticence about bringing cases related to climate change before international courts, because they're very concerned about how do you, how do you prove causation? How do you establish that the actions of one state has caused the sea level rise in another state? Uh, so the amount of evidence, it's always the burden of proof falls on the state that's making the claim and they have to produce evidence to a standard of, um, on a balance of probabilities, so a similar burden of proof to what you'd be familiar with in uh, domestic civil proceedings. Uh, whether, it's going to depend a lot on the case as to what evidence is accepted. Uh, what we saw in the South China Sea Tribunal uh, decision was that uh, the um, tribunal appointed experts uh, to do their own studies of the particular issue. So there's always that possibility for a court to get uh, independent experts to, you know, give them reports on particular issues that they're interested in. And certainly the parties will always provide uh, many, many pages of documents for the court to review as well. I was... Uh Curious because it was only states versus states, so like um, Australia versus Japan kind of thing. And I was curious to if that means only sponsored kind of projects by the state or state actions can be brought to the court. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. My question is about uh, uh, the concept of judicialization when we, in the context of complex global problems and uh, 
balance of power between the developer and the developing countries. I'll give you a sample to, uh, to demonstrate uh, what I'm saying. If we look at the case of South China Sea, China indeed did not participate in the case because it has intention not to, not to comply with whatever the outcome of the case is. And if we also look at the case of Chagos, uh, I think it has several dimensions the historical rights and obligations of the parties, uh, the economic considerations of uh, UK, and then the military presence of the US, and then the political dimension, which relates to power relations and balance of power, and the historical context of colonization. I don't know how we can fit a judicialization in this complex problem. Maybe you'll help us to. Thank you. So my question is about the judicialization and specifically the judges from the small island states, et cetera, is who bears the costs of those judges' time when they're considering these things? So a country like Malta, a contribution to the ITLOS, their judge, would that be borne by Malta or is that borne by the people who bring the, court, the case? Who bears that cost and is it a limiting factor? All right, do you want to go with those three and then we'll sure. work back over? Uh, so for the International Court of Justice, only states can be parties to cases that are brought before that particular court. Uh, what does happen occasionally, at least with advisory opinions, and this happening, I would say, with the, a request for the advisory opinion, is that you will have civil society actors that work very closely with particular governments, particularly some of the smaller governments that have potentially less legal resources to work on their pleadings. But, th you know, that's going to be a lot about, well, who has access to the, you know, the lawyers of a particular government to be able to have that relationship, to be able to do that work. Uh, you get a lot of law firms that will put their hands up to do this work pro bono just for the experience of being able to argue at the ICJ. Uh, but at the end of the day, they, they're interstate disputes. The investor state dispute settlement regime I mentioned, that is one where it is usually a foreign investor, so a private individual or most likely a multinational corporation that is bringing a case against a state. And then in the human rights setting, that is the situation where you will have individuals who have standing before international or regional courts to be able to bring, uh, bring cases in that instance. So it does limit uh, what cases can be heard in these, in these different settings. In relation to the balance of power and the geopolitics, it is a really interesting question because at the end of the day, every single case that you deal with, they deal with these very particular legal questions, but it's always in a much broader um, historical, political, economic, social context. And that's actually one of the reasons I love international law because it's, you've got to understand all of these other dynamics that are going on and the role that law can play. And recognizing that there's limits to the law as well as great potential in how it can be used. And at least with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, one of the interesting things about it is the reason that you've got that compulsory mechanism is because the, the less powerful states at the time that treaty was negotiated said we want a mechanism to be able to protect our rights against the more powerful states of the time. And that is one of the reasons we ended up with this mechanism. It's also one of the reasons there's some carve outs for particular disputes as well. It's one of the reasons the United States is not a party to that particular treaty. But what we've seen, and I've, I've got a colleague at UNSW who is studying this, is that small states have been using international litigation really effectively to advance their causes. And, you know, Mauritius didn't get very far with the Chagos Marine Protected Area arbitration, but it has pursued an extremely clever litigation strategy in terms of going to, first of all, um, the arbitration it then was successful in getting the advisory opinion from the ICJ that recognised that the United Kingdom had acted unlawfully and had to leave. And then it, then it went back to the Unclosed Dispute Settlement Mechanism to organise a maritime boundary delimitation dispute between Mauritius and the Maldives. 
And the only way that Mauritius and Maldives have a maritime boundary is if you recognise that Mauritius lawfully has the Chagos Archipelago. And so the tribunal in that case basically said, oh, well, the ICJ said in its advisory opinion, that wasn't legally binding, but let's gloss over that, that the UK wasn't entitled to be there. So yeah, sure, we'll say Mauritius is the coastal state for resolving this maritime boundary dispute. So Mauritius has kind of got what it wanted, but not fully at this point, because obviously the US is still there and the UK is still insisting on its position. But it's getting there, I reckon, and I think it's, it's quite impressive in the way that it has managed that. And, you know, similarly, the Netherlands um, brought a case against Russia uh, in relation to the Arctic uh, sunrise that had been seized when the Greenpeace protesters were there. And ultimately, the Greenpeace uh, vessel was released, so was the Arctic 30, even though one of them was a Russian national as well. So they, you know, it wasn't directly because of the proceedings, but they got there. So again, it's kind of like international law plays a role, but it's not always going to be the decisive role. That's, that's part of the process. So there's, and obviously China's not adhering to the South China Sea arbitral award. It's not going to anytime soon. Um, when you look at what was decided in that judgment, there's, there's a few little rays of light that came through about what China has not done, which you could potentially say, well, you know, it's good, it didn't do this, which showed that it wasn't overstepping what had been decided in the tribunal. But there's plenty of things that it has done that shows disregard for it too. So I, I'm not going to oversell those points at all. Uh, then in terms of the judges and who bears the costs to pay for them, uh, in terms of the judges of both the International Court of Justice and the judges for the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, they are appointed through mechanisms, so with the ICJ appointed through the UN, their salaries are part of a UN budget. And so to the extent that countries are paying the UN budget, part of that money goes to paying their salaries. Similarly, the states that are parties to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, they put in the money that goes to the running of the tribunal. Different story for ad hoc arbitration. There, the states have to pay for their arbitrators. And usually the costs are then split between the two parties. In one instance, uh, there was a case where, uh, I think it was the Duzgit, Duzgit Integrity Arbitration, where Sayatomo and Principe had, I think, just kind of had enough of the proceedings and wasn't paying any more the arbitrators. And so at that point, um, I think Malta had to front up the costs. I might be misremembering that, so don't quote me. With the, with the Arctic Sunrise case, the Netherlands fronted the money for the Russia's arbitrators. Uh, to be able to get that case heard at the time. So um, there's different ways of doing that. But there are also funds available through the International Court of Justice, through ITLOS, and also through the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which uh, usually runs the ad hoc arbitrations where they can give financial assistance uh, to developing countries. So developing countries are not necessarily precluded from these dispute settlement mechanisms because of the costs of, uh, of hiring judges. Hiring the lawyers, that's a different question. If they work pro bono, then so much the better. Hello. Um, I was just wondering about uh, preventative measures. You talked a lot about remedies. Um, and I wanted to know how these courts can be leveraged for pre preventative measures. Um, in my head, I'm thinking about uh, deep sea mining and how current that problem is. Uh, and that it hasn't happened yet. Um, and I'm also wondering if UNCLOSE has any language about environmental impact assessment within it. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, this was an amazing lecture. My question is regarding judicialization, not particularly with respect to IMEL, though. So uh, while you were talking about the risks of judicialization, I was wondering, could there be any risks for non-judicialization? Like in the Bay of Bengal cases, uh, the states were directed to negotiate further, and uh, like the three states have not really reached further, and that area still remains not utilized, not exploited. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. My background is very far from law, but is in international relations. 
So what I want to ask about is that currently evidence of the ecocidal actions is being collected by Ukraine to prove that Russia is violating international law by knowingly causing severe widespread and long-term damage to our land and water. Although international marine law seems to be much more interested in whether the grain can pass through Ukrainian waters, and rightfully so, as Ukraine is arguably the most significant party in tackling a global food crisis in Africa, I still wonder what is the state of marine environmental law research interest in Canada on the impact of Russian military advance on Ukrainian seas, although this is a relatively fresh topic. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, there have all been such interesting questions. I very much appreciate your engagement. Uh, it is interesting to think about preventative measures and how to leverage the courts. And the first thing I, I thought about when you mentioned the deep seabed mining is because we, there's been a push from some countries for a moratorium. What I would love to see happen is that if, for example, Nauru is one of the countries that's very keen to have corporations start uh, the deep seabed mining. Uh, if another state essentially um, commenced proceedings against Nauru, saying that you know by doing that you're, you know, uh, violating the obligation to prevent, uh, to protect and preserve the marine environment, and what the state that brings those proceedings could then seek is provisional measures, an injunction, to stop any mining activity happening until. Uh, the time that that case is done. It's a really fascinating idea. I'm sure there's a journal article in it, but, um, but that would be the, most, the first thing that comes to mind in terms of trying to leverage the courts would be to seek provisional measures. And one of the reasons that, that comes to mind is because specifically under UNCLOSE, in the provision that refers to giving these sorts of injunctions, uh, they're given to protect the marine environment. That is one of the reasons that is listed there. And so that has provided, uh, it's usually it lost giving these orders as a really firm basis for making uh, calls about taking steps to try and uh, protect the marine environment. Uh, there is a provision in UNCLOSE, uh, Article 206, which refers to the requirement to undertake environmental impact assessments. So that is an obligation uh, under UNCLOSE as well and has been recognised as part of customary international law by the International Court of Justice too. And it was uh, a claim that the Philippines made against China in the South China Sea arbitration. And there, there had been a study that had been conducted by China in relation to the island building activities. Uh, it, so it was reported, but one of the obligations around an EIA is that you're supposed to publish the results of that, and they couldn't find the study as to where it had been published, so as a result, China was still found to be in violation of that obligation. Uh, I suspect that EIAs will also be coming up in the uh, climate change advisory opinions. In relation to judicialization and the risks for non-judicialization, and it is an interesting question because certainly I know in the Bay of Bengal that's one of several cases where the court goes, oh, well, we've said these things now. Let me just throw it back to you to try and figure this out. And they've done that quite frequently in relation to reparations as well. It's, and I think it's partly because the courts don't want to have to engage with these questions about compensation. They're like you just try and sort it out, and we're here if, here if you need. Um, so the, the, there is a problem with that. There is a possibility, and we saw it happen with uh, the ICJ decision with Colombia and Nicaragua, where Nicaragua squeaked in um, before the Pact of Bogota had expired as a basis of jurisdiction and was able to bring a further case against Colombia for failing to adhere to the judgment really was what that case was about, though they had to phrase it differently. Uh, but it is problematic, I think, in terms of uh, the outer continental shelf, it's going to also be a question before the Commission for the limits of the continental shelf as well. In relation to Ukraine and Russia, there's so much that could be said about that at the moment. Even before the war began, uh, well, after the invasion of Ukraine, before the 22, uh, February 22 invasion, 
uh, Ukraine had already taken proceedings against Russia uh, under UNCLOSE in relation to the seizure of three Ukrainian warships and also in uh, relation to the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait. Uh, both of those cases are essentially on hold because all of Russia's lawyers um, resigned and refused to act. So I'm not quite sure where they have gotten to. Where we're at now is that any further uh, litigation is going to have to be done under what's known as the laws of armed conflict. And that would likely be excluded from the jurisdiction of the unclosed dispute settlement. What needs to be done, in, in my view, and having gone through this um, with the government of Eritrea back in 1998, a while ago, hopefully some of you were born then, um, <laughs> knowing that Eritrea and Ethiopia were engaged in a border conflict at that time, we started gathering evidence uh, right from the start about what was going on at the time. And when the two countries did ultimately agree to a peace treaty, Part of the peace negotiations was the establishment of a claims commission. And so the evidence that was being gathered could all then be presented to this claims commission and that ultimately involved um, uh, claims being resolved and then an award for damages being made at the time. And that went so far as to also a ruling about which country had um, acted unlawfully in declaring war. Um, unfortunately, the, the commission said it was Eritrea, but uh, of course I thought that was wrong. Um, but that's, that's what I think Ukraine needs to be doing at the moment. There's going to be lots of legal avenues. It just doesn't help them right now, unfortunately. So on that sober note. <laughs> <laughs> on that sober yet important to reflect on note, um, I want to issue a huge thank you, Professor Natalie Klein, for coming as our Douglas M. Johnson lecturer. <laughs> I think, I hope that um, students from the College of Sustainability will find that this is an exciting and inspiring way to start thinking about the potential of law and international law for sustainability issues. I know. Um, Professor Alan Boyle had, in fact, gave one of the Douglas M. Johnson lectures a few years ago, and so this is a nice um, continuity. I know he'd be very proud of, of what you had to say. Um, as a final note, uh, a thank you from us, uh, Marine Environmental Law, to the College of Sustainability for this. Um, and uh, just a foreshadowing again that um, towards the end, in think November 23rd, we will have the launch of the Meinhard Duell Legacy Lecture. So you will be hearing more about law, but it will be more domestic uh, law, I think, the local environmental laws of Canada. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. <laughs>